Thank you, brother. Uh, I get confused about the title as well. All y'all need to know is that I work with Monica Thompson. And everybody started praying. Oh, Monica, stop clapping for yourself. Sheesh. I, huh. Let me tell the story then. So we're going to have, uh, last night we were planning to do the Lord's Supper. And by the way, when Jonathan said we had an hour invitation, don't be afraid. Because I'm, I'm sure that kind of sucked the wind right out of the room. We're going to have an hour long invitation this morning. I've got a crock pot going. We'll keep it down to about 45 minutes. So I told Monica we were going to do Lord's Supper, and I asked her to help me out with finding the, like, gluten-free, just so that it wouldn't be an issue. Just anybody and everybody. I'll not have a problem with taking the Lord's Supper. So, so Monica, being the overachiever that she is, she doesn't just find gluten-free bread or crackers. She wants to make gluten-free bread. So I get here Friday night... And um, Lily gets me at the back door. She's like, you've got to try this. Try this. And it's like we're sampling Lord's Supper bread. And she put, she's trying to, you made it into like a, like a meal. Like it had onion and rosemary, parsley, sage, rosemary and thyme is the old song. She put all kind of stuff in it. It was like, this is really tasty. It's not a buffet. Okay. We're not trying to make a meal of, and I think Jennifer told you to put cheese in it. I mean, come on overachievers. But uh, this has been a fantastic weekend, uh, and I just want to say also, Jonathan has already thanked everybody, and I want to say the same, because uh, I served in student ministry for a very long time, for about 20-something uh, years, and know that it takes a lot of prayer, a lot of effort, a lot of people uh, to, to make a weekend like this happen, just so that we can get to Sunday morning and allow the students a chance to take a nap because you're going to hear some snoring over here this morning. But uh, I will say that last night, the whole weekend has been really good and, and it's been all about unity as, as you've seen. And so last night to see students, to see young people, when, when, the, when the call is given to respond to the word of God and, and you see that the altar is full of students and adults praying over the students. That's exciting. Matter of fact, about 30, 40 minutes into it, and they're still coming and going. And there, was, there wasn't just like it's the last night of camp kind of stuff and it's just emotion. There may have been some of that. But when there's weeping at the altar, and then they take it back to their seat, and there's weeping at the seats. Church, be encouraged. This generation is getting it. And they need you to keep fanning that into flame. Because they're watching you. They're watching us to see what does this life look like when we surrender our lives to Christ. And so, for the weekend, the theme has been unity. And I know I've been in church long enough, I'm old enough to remember what it's like to have different generations fighting or arguing, or that's not my style of music, that's not my thing, that's not, that's just, you're reaching this age group and you're forgetting us. We're in this thing together. I love the fact that we're singing Jesus paid it all, and we're singing some new stuff that I haven't even heard, but just maybe a month ago. And we're singing Hank Williams. I saw the light. How awesome is that? You know, of course, we are still in Wetumpka, right? Roll Tide. There you go. Work that in there. <laughs> Giddy up. That's right. It takes all of us together doing this. Because God has called us to a very unique life. Matter of fact, it's a special life. It is full and abundant life. And we're supposed to be able to look at each other, be encouraged, be challenged, be held accountable. And that's the body of believers that are in this room. And I wish everybody could have experienced this entire weekend. 
especially last night. But to the students, let me say, whatever happened last night, whatever the Lord has been doing in your life last night, it better not stop last night. It better not stop today. Because tomorrow, when you go back to work or school or the practice field or wherever you're headed, that's when we'll see if last night was just emotion or was it true? Was it real? So we're pulling for you. Church, can we say that we are praying for our students? Because y'all know, we know that what it is like to be a teenager, a young adult trying to figure out life and figure out the patterns and figure out the crossroads and figure out everything else in light of the gospel, in light of trying to figure out a career and all these decisions, do I go to college, do I not, what do I study, what kind of job do I go for? A lot of us have been there. And so we're praying for you. So this morning, part of what they've been studying, we all get to be a part of this together, and it is the call of the Christian life. And what does that mean? What does that look like for all of us together? And there's something that, that Peter talks about in Second Peter that, to me, it's almost like he's helping us gauge, are we being effective or are we not? Because as we are together in this call to be God's ambassador, to be God's representative in this world, we want to be effective, right? Like, it doesn't matter what your job title is. Every person, I would say every single person in this room wants to be effective at whatever their job is. If your job is to make gluten-free Lord's Supper bread, you want to be effective at it, right? You want to make sure that recipe is just right. Nobody in here wants to be useless. Can we agree on that? Let me look at the students just to make sure no one raised their hand. Anybody want to be useless? There's always one in every crowd. Okay, just check. Nobody wants to be useless. We want to make sure that the most important job on the planet, which is to be the representative of Jesus, is carried out and is done well. We want to make sure that we're effective in this call. So we're going to be in Second Peter chapter 1, because this is where Peter helps us to understand, are you being effective as God's ambassador, as God's representative? So Second Peter chapter 1, we're going to be in verses 3 through 15. And let me tell you real quick while you're turning there, here's how God kind of birthed this in my heart, in my life. So as a student pastor, and I couldn't remember when, when Jonathan asked me to, to speak on Sunday morning, which I really appreciate Pastor Tim allowing me the opportunity to share his pulpit. Um, I couldn't remember if I told this story or not. So if I did, just smile and, you know, we'll be done here shortly. So uh, when I was a student pastor, I was serving in Selma. My third church was First Baptist Selma, Alabama. And most of y'all know Selma, right? Like some places in the state where I get to go and, and, and help with people, they don't know Selma. They don't know all that is Selma, right? You got to say it, Selma. So we were downtown Selma. Our church was in the heartbeat of downtown. It was the one that looks like the big cathedral the catholic looking building had gargoyles on the bell tower that whole thing going on and so as a matter of fact someone told me when i came on staff there they said if you can survive this church you can survive anywhere i'm like well dang gina nobody told me that when i signed up for this job it wasn't in the brochure so i get there and they're like showing me around and you talk about uh, an ornate type setting there's sanctuary is like a museum. It is absolutely beautiful. And two of the pieces, just real quick, take, there was a, a mosaic over here and a stained glass window above the baptistry, and they said those two, there was a, a local artist who grew up in Selma, and in 1904 or 03, she moved to New York City, and she trained under the Tiffany Glass Company, and she came home and was commissioned by the church to do these two pieces. They said these are Tiffany originals, and they can't even get insurance on them. And I'm like, don't tell me that. We're going to play hide-and-go-seek in this building, right? 
That is insane. So that's just kind of the, the setting for this. And while I was there, I was still, I was in my late 20s, early 30s, and I was still wrestling with what is this ministry all about? What are we supposed to be doing? And, and I was still full of pride, working on building my own name. And I come across Matthew chapter 23, where Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. And as he's talking to the Pharisees, y'all know the Pharisees were the religious leaders who pretty much, they were the hired holy men. They had it all figured out. They had it going on. And Jesus just dogged them. He said, you guys have completely missed the mark because you're straining gnats. So they would literally strain gnats out of their drinking water, but they would swallow the camel. He said, you guys are like whitewashed tombs. You're beautiful on the outside, but you're full of death and decay on the inside. You've missed the mark. And here's what got me, because I realized something about the Pharisees. The Pharisees thought they had it right. Can you imagine? They had gone their entire ministry thinking what we're doing is good. What we're doing is effective and productive. And Jesus looks at him and goes, you have completely missed everything I've told you to do, that God has told you to do. And he told him, you'll cross land and sea to make a convert. And when you do, you make them twice the sons of hell that you are. Whew. So here I am at First Baptist Selma. And I am the hired holy man for student ministry, building my name. And it just hits me like a ton of bricks. What am I doing? And so I asked the Lord this one simple question. If you were to walk into this beautiful building right now and we start talking about ministry, where would you point in my life where I'm missing the mark? And without a doubt, there were two main issues the Holy Spirit began to deal with me about. The first is that everything in this world is for the glory of of God. Everything. And the second thing is where we're going to camp out. Everything you do in ministry is supposed to be making disciples, not developing programs. Because that's kind of what I was doing. I was working on programs in the church, keeping our people busy. Because we were doing youth stuff constantly. We were doing the the lock-ins, lock-outs, bowling, Bible studies, mission trips, and this camp, and that thing. And What's the point of it all is to make disciples. And so I just began focusing on that. And I just began asking the Lord, would you please then help me understand? I see where I'm missing the mark. Now, please help me in this. Because I don't want to come to the end of my ministry or the end of my life just to hear Jesus say, you missed it. You completely missed what I told you to do in my word. You did a lot of religious stuff. You did a lot of programs. You kept my people busy, but you didn't, but you did not make disciples. I don't want that. And I guarantee you, deep down, none of us in this room want that. We want to be effective and productive in the things that Jesus has told us to do. Amen? Or as the students might say now, giddy up. I told him on Friday night when I was a, when I was a kid in our church, that little country church I grew up in, I didn't want to be traditional and say amen, so I gave the preacher a giddy up. <laughs> and I gave them the challenge of, all right, so on Sunday morning when your pastor's going at it, give him a giddy up instead of an amen. So, sorry, Tim. Giddy up. All right, Second Peter chapter 1. So let's see, what does it take to be effective and productive? Let's see what Peter says. Let's start in verse 3. Verse 3, 2 Peter chapter 1. He says that his divine... By, by the way, uh, he's talking to the believers. This is to the church. This is the believers in Asia Minor. He says, God's divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. And so through these things, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. Let me pause right there. That divine nature, 
we understand that when we surrender our life to Christ, we then have the Holy Spirit of God comes into our life. He resides in us. That's God's divine nature. The very power that raised Jesus from the dead, the very power that spoke this universe into existence lives in the believer. That is crazy. But that's God's divine power and we get to have that living inside of us so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Can we agree together that this world, even our society, our culture is becoming more and more evil? We talked about the other night. Yeah, we can't get up. Thank you. I want to point this out. Someone over the age of 20 just gave me a giddy up right over there. So we can agree that in our culture, in our society, that things are getting further and further from God. And we talked the other night about one of the things that is causing this would be selfishness. There's a lot of selfishness that people are holding on to, and it's creating a darker, further from God society. Matter of fact, one example of this. Uh, was not too long ago, went to the movies. I was in Prattville. And there was, like, about halfway through the movie, there was like a, a lull in the noise of the movie, and in the little hallway that leads into the theater, there was this thud, real loud thud, and we heard a woman scream. So what do you think our first thought was? Yeah, active shooter. Now, 10 years ago, you hear something in the theater? What's your response 10 years ago? Shut up. We, we just paid 50 bucks for popcorn, a drink, and a ticket to watch this stupid movie. Be quiet. Not anymore. Our first thought now is active shooter. How sad is that? Matter of fact, I was at a, at a little church, and probably this church right here probably has some type of security in place, right? somebody's probably packing in this room right now. And I'm just picturing right now that it's someone's mama. I think that's awesome. Don't try anything. Mama going to take you out. Right? Most small churches, most big churches, now every church almost has some type of security for that very reason. That's the society that we live in now. So let's keep going. Verse 5, for this very reason, for this very reason, Peter is saying the world is getting further from God. So for all of you Christians, here you go. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and godliness brotherly affection. And to brotherly affection, finally, he says, add love. Verse 8, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Notice what he says. Make every effort to grow in these characteristics. These characteristics are very similar to fruit of the Spirit. It is not something that we just happen upon or that we just fall into, but it is intentional. We are to be intentionally growing in Christ. That's why I say, students, whatever you've heard this weekend, whatever God is teaching any of us, we need to be intentional to be obedient to those things. Follow through with whatever the Holy Spirit is changing in us. Because change is a natural part of being a Christian, right? It's the sanctification process. And we need to be intentional to follow through with that. And he says, in increasing measure we are to be growing so that means that we don't just arrive at a point in our faith and our knowledge where we stop growing we're constantly to be growing in all of these in self-control in knowledge in brotherly affection and love so we should be stirred up constantly right so i'm i'm fairly visual let me give let me paint a picture for you since it's almost lunchtime. 
You ever been to a Mexican restaurant that had a buffet? You don't see them quite often. First time in Decatur, when I, where I'd served for eight and a half years, first time I went into a restaurant that had a buffet, Mexican restaurant that had a buffet. I was kind of scared at first. But then I saw they had guacamole, so I'm like, all right, I'm in, right? But in the middle of the buffet was a big pan of refried beans. Do you know what happens to refried beans when they sit under a heating lamp untouched for about an hour? How the the top gets hard and crusty and then it begins to crack open as if there's some type of earthquake going on deep down. And the edges along the stainless steel starts to crawl up a little bit. It does not look very appealing. And then some, you know, one of the restaurant workers will come along and take a big spoon and stir it up and put that hard skin on the bottom so that you don't see it. And then someone comes along, oh, this looks fresh. And it's like, don't touch it, Junior. Don't touch it. It's nasty. Can you just imagine, what if we're not growing spiritually? What if we claim Christ? But we're not, but we say we haven't learned anything. We haven't changed in a long time because the, we're not allowing the Lord to move and to change and to stir us. Can you just imagine that when God looks at us, that that's what he sees? That when the world looks at us, that's what they see? Why would they want your Jesus? When we're the ones, if we're not growing, if we're not making every effort to grow in the characteristics of the Holy Spirit, why would they look at us and go, no, that's what I want. I didn't look at that buffet and look at that big vat of hard crust and go, no, that's what I want right there. That looks awesome. No, kept moving. And so when the world looks at us and they see this hard crust, this apathy, this nasty exterior of there's no health, there's no vibrant growth, there's no abundant life. Next, I'm going to move on. If that's the Jesus you serve, I really don't want any part of that. Do you all see what I'm saying? Like the Holy Spirit should be stirring us because we are to be growing in the image of Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18 We are being made into the very image of Jesus. I don't know about you, I'll admit, I've got a long way to go. I need to be hearing from the Lord and obeying the Lord on a consistent basis, and I need my heart stirred. To ensure that this goes on, there's two questions that I regularly ask of myself and of the people that I'm discipling. Two questions. Number one, what has God taught you lately? What has God taught you recently because if my answer if I have to answer this and go back more than a month something's wrong with my relationship with the Lord if you haven't heard from the Lord in a while then there's some type of a wall or barrier between you and him you need to work on that so the first question what has God taught you lately and second what are you doing about that because when you hear from the Lord, usually there's change that he's calling for. Whether it's growth, change, repent, stop, start, whatever it is, there's something that he's telling us to do. And therefore, we are told, make every effort to grow in these characteristics in increasing measure. Allow the Holy Spirit to stir that heart. We'll go on. Verse 9, but whoever does not have these things is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past. Verse 12, let's skip down. So I will always, so I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus has made clear to me. So Peter knows that he's about to check out. He's at the end of his life. And he says this, because notice he said, you make every effort to grow spiritually. And as their mentor, as their teacher, as the older Christian in the room, he said this in verse 15, and I will make every effort 
to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. So he's playing a part in this. He's not out free. He says, whatever it is that I have been taught from the Lord and the people who taught me, I'm going to make sure that after I'm gone, you remember this. Church, let me, let me throw this on all of us who've been following the Lord for more than a week. We are directly responsible to make sure that the people who are behind us spiritually are taught and reminded of the things that Jesus has been teaching us. The things that he has given you is not meant to stop with you. The things that he's taught you is meant to be passed on. All right, let me, let me pick on the millennials in the room for just a second. Actually, I'm not going to pick on you. I'm actually going to kind of build you up a little bit. Do you realize that the millennials in the room, the millennial generation, they now say the oldest, the oldest, depends on which source you look at, but they say that some of the oldest millennials are now, next year will be 40 years old. Okay, that's the, the oldest end of the spectrum is about 40 years old. The youngest is around 20, 21. They will be, next year, in 2020, they will be the biggest workforce, biggest part of the workforce in the U.S., okay? So here's why I'm telling you this. There was a study done that surveyed a lot of people in this generation, and this was in the business world, and they found that the millennials are hungry for mentoring. About 68% of those surveyed said they'd be willing to stay at their job because a lot of millennials are known for going from serving at one job for a very short period of time and then going to another one, serving for a very short period of time and then moving on. They said they'd be willing to stay at a job more than five years. 68% said they would stay longer if somebody would mentor them. They also surveyed this group and the, and the group said that they don't want to just make a paycheck. They don't want just financial success. They want to know that what they're investing their life in, their job, is making an impact on a larger scale. So this is from the business world. But it's very telling about that generation. So here's, here's what we're hearing. So you're telling me that you have a, an entire generation that's about to take over our workforce next year who values relationship and they want to be mentored and they want to know that there's a greater purpose than just making a paycheck. Church, do you think we have something to learn from that? Do we know something that is of great purpose? You better believe it. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the greatest story known to mankind because he is the ultimate hope. So here's my challenge. If you are over the age of 40, and if you've been following Jesus for any amount of time, here's a side challenge to you. Take a millennial to lunch. Hear their story. Hear their questions, their thoughts, their doubts, their victories, their plans. And share yours. Share your story. Share your Jesus journey with them. Because they want to know. Who doesn't want to know that? Not just the millennials. Maybe we should make that a national holiday. Take a millennial to lunch day. How great would that be? And all the millennials in the room said, Giddy up. <laughs> I'm still not used to that. Matter of fact, let me, let me, let me tell you this. As far as students... This generation, the student's generation, is called Generation Z. Sorry, guys, y'all got stuck with Z. Uh, mine is X. I mean, that's not much better. So Generation Z, they say, uh, what was the percentage? Between the ages of 13 to 18, when Generation Z has three to five adults investing in them while in church, Okay, this is in the church world. They are much more likely to continue in their faith in college. Three to five 
adults investing in students will almost, not everything's a guarantee, but that will almost ensure that they will continue in their faith when they go off to college and they begin their own journey, their family journey, and their career journey. I encourage you. Look, Jonathan and his team, they're working hard to invest in these students, but they can't do it alone. And I say that as a former student pastor. If you want to make sure that these students, when they go off to college or they begin their careers, that they continue in the faith and the things that you all have been teaching them now, invest in them. Pray for them and invest in them. Three to five adults between when they're 13 to 18. And I can tell you that that is absolutely true because the other day I had a couple of my students, former students who are now in ministry, they were referring back to when they were in eighth grade. There was one of our volunteers in our student ministry. His name was Mark. And Mark would meet with the eighth grade boys on Friday morning at the horse stables in our town. And they would do Bible study. Now that's just sketchy, right? Who in the world is going to meet with eighth grade boys when there's anywhere near manure? Mark. And you know what? Now these guys are in their 20s. They're serving churches and they name him when they talk about people who have made a difference in their life. That's awesome. That is your opportunity as a church family. So look, I get it. There's a lot of stuff you can do. Pray. Ask the Lord, how do I invest in that generation? How do I invest in any generation? How do I invest in anybody that God brings in our path? We've been told Jesus clearly laid this out for us. If you want to make sure you're effective and productive, then do what Jesus said to do in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, when he clearly said he has every ounce of authority in heaven and on earth. And so here's what I'm telling you to do, guys. Make disciples. Do this of all the nations. You make disciples. You baptize them and you teach them everything I've given to you. And I'm going to be with you every step of the way. So, here's our challenge. Make disciples. Be effective. As you're growing personally, as Peter's talking about, you're growing, you're making every effort to make sure that you're being stirred up. And if you need that picture to be reminded of don't just sit and soak, remember the refried beans, okay? Be stirred. Make every effort to grow spiritually and invest that in someone else. Walk with them into maturity. And I know that Pastor Tim is starting next week with the sermon series, Who is Your One? Love that. You're going to continue to be challenged for the next several weeks in this very thing. So here's... Here's our response. Here's our response time. Here's our question for you. As we go out of here, or as we have our, our time, I know, Zach, they're, they're going to come back up here and, and sing another song. And I, In our response time, I would challenge you first, believers in the room, ask the Lord, where am I missing the mark? Because I could tell you story after story of the effect the effect of discipling other people, of growing spiritually and then passing it on and how that affects me, but also how it affects the other people. But I trust the Holy Spirit. I trust the Holy Spirit to do His job. And if you, as you're having your time with the Lord, not just this morning, not just today as we sing, but as you read through Scripture, I would challenge you, I dare you, ask the question of the Holy Spirit, where am I missing the mark? and listen to him, and respond. And friend, I guarantee you, if you're not following Jesus yet, his first response to you is going to be, repent and believe that Jesus is who he says he is, who is the Son of God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to God except through Jesus. And if you want to know more about how to start that relationship, if you want to consider the cost of following Jesus, 
come and talk to Pastor Tim. Talk with somebody before you get out of here today.